There we go. All right, so I swear the rest of my slides don't have this many words on them. This is just a disclaimer slide. So the purpose of this presentation is just to discuss large mammals of Indiana, historically, present, and into the future. Uh, this is also used to discuss the large mammal report form and how best to report any large mammal sightings you may have in Indiana. Whether you had them in the past or now, it's all really good data to have that can inform where we've seen large mammals and what habitats they're associated with. Uh, I'm presenting information that's based on uh, published information from the scientific community. Uh, and and it, this is in no way to discredit any sightings that anyone has had of any animals. I'm not going to go out there and say that you haven't seen a bear or a mountain lion in Indiana because transient animals do occur. Uh, they move outside of their known geographic ranges. And in fact, we had a mountain lion in Indiana in 2010. So there's proof right there that transient animals do happen. They can cross large distances and these uh, rare sightings are possible. Uh, and then also that your feedback is very valuable to us. So this is the first large mammal webinar we've had. And I definitely like feedback in terms of how we can improve this uh, for you. If we could know a little bit about you, uh, what is your user group? Are you uh, a nature observer? Are you a hunter? Are you just, uh, are you in the classroom and you wanna educate kids? And so how could we tailor a presentation such as this to best suit your needs so that we can work on future webinars uh, to meet uh, your needs, as I'm sure there are many people out there who have needs similar to yours. So let's get into this. What is a large mammal? Well, it's entirely subjective. Uh, a large mammal, it, it depends on where you define it. Is it dependent on size, so height at the shoulders, the weight? Are we looking at only native animals? Uh, are we looking at animals that have been here so long that they're considered naturalized now? So you got to set that baseline. And so I'll set that baseline right now for Indiana. Indiana's baseline for large mammals since about the end of the Ice Age to the 1800s uh, includes the gray wolf, the elk, the black bear, mountain lions, and bison. Now, at the turn of the century in the 1800s to the 1900s, uh, there was lots of westward expansion of Europeans and colonists moving further across the United States, coming across states such as Indiana, where they saw wildlife as this endless supply, uh, not only of furs and meat, uh, but of anything they needed from wildlife. So they essentially took without thinking about the future. And as you can see in this picture of, of bison skulls compared to the size of these two guys here, uh, you could tell that they took and took and took without regard for what effects that might have on not only the populations of these animals, but uh, future uh, human use for these animals as well. And so uh, wildlife, in fact, as we know now, we're not an infinite resource. In addition to that, predators were vilified. There are plenty of fairy tales that vilify wolves and bears, uh, and those came with humans across the seas from Europe. And so we vilified wolves and things like mountain lions and bears. Bounties were put on their heads. And if you saw them, you were supposed to shoot them because life on the front range was very difficult and you had to do what you had to do to survive. And because of that, we lost the predators as well. And so by the mid 1800s to the early 1900s, we had lost all of those large mammals that I showed you on that last slide, here in Indiana at least. And so what are the modern large mammals of Indiana? Well, the most common large mammal of Indiana that we're gonna have, uh, although still very rare, is gonna be the American black bear, which you have pictured in the top right of your screen here. Next to this picture of the black bear, you have two maps of the black bear's geographic range. Uh, the picture on the, the map on the left, pardon me, is of their historic range. And so this is their range all across Canada, the, the United States, and down into Mexico. You can see it covers most of the uh, United States here compared to 1995, where they uh, were severely restricted in the 90s. Uh, this is after very intensive forest management practices went into place to improve habitat for species like bears, as well as all the other species uh, that we are trying to protect and conserve. Uh, and because of this uh, enhanced forestry efforts of protecting habitats and trying to reintroduce some species, uh, bears were actually able to move back into some of these areas, such as Appalachia, uh, down into Missouri and Arkansas, 
And you can tell that Indiana uh, is still vacant where black bears were in 1995 at least. But you can also tell that there's a population of black bears north of us in Wisconsin and Michigan uh, and to the south and the east down in Kentucky. And since then, the Kentucky population has been getting closer and closer to our southern border. Next, we have the gray wolf. Uh, their historic population is in uh, green on this map next to their picture. And then their current range is the dotted area. So their current range, uh, the closest areas are Canada, Wisconsin, and uh, Michigan. Although uh, this is a little further away than black bears, it's still possible to get transient animals down here to Indiana. And finally, the mountain lion, which can occur throughout the Americas, North America, Central America, and South America. And I'm gonna zoom in on this map so we can get a better idea of what's going on in North America. Uh, so they have populations historically that ranged all the way across. You had a Western and an Eastern mountain lion. Uh, since then, we've lost the Eastern mountain lions. And this is the current range of the uh, mountain lion uh, as we know it in North America. And the closest populations you can see there uh, above where it says United States, uh, that's going to be North and South Dakota, right beneath the border of Canada, and then Nebraska beneath that. And that's about 800 miles in a straight line to the nearest border with Indiana. Uh, so definitely not close, but as I said, you can get transient animals that move across. So talking about these transient animals, the gray wolf, we had one show up in Western Indiana in 2003. Um, a gentleman who owned land uh, thought that he had a coyote on his property that was causing damage. So he, he took aim and fired, not really thinking that a wolf could be on his property, but when he went to investigate the corpse, uh, he saw that it was definitely not a coyote. It was much, much larger and looked different, too. So he contacted Indiana DNR. We contacted U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We were able to hand the species over to the, the carcass over to them. And as it is an endangered species in the United States, uh, they took over the investigation from that point. They were able to confirm through DNA that it was actually uh, a member of a pack up in Wisconsin that had been uh, marked with a tattoo on the lip. Uh, from a couple years back. And for whatever reason, it just wanted to disperse to try to find habitat of its own, maybe try to seek out mates elsewhere. But it just took off on a beeline down to Indiana and it made it down here. Uh, and unfortunately, it did not meet a happy fate. Uh, but now we know it's possible that wolves can cross that distance from Minnesota, from Wisconsin, all the way down to Indiana, even skirting around cities as large as Chicago. Now, moving on to mountain lions. We have had two sightings of what we believe was one mountain lion. The first sighting was in November of 2009 in Clay County. There was a hunter in a tree stand uh, during dirt deer season. He was, uh, you know, waiting for his deer, scouting it out, and uh, this, this cat happened to go through the area that he was watching. He was able to get these two shaky cell phone fo uh, photos of it, uh, which was very fortunate for us uh, so that we could go back out to this site and measure the size of this shag bark hickory that you see in the center of the photo on the left. So we can get an idea for how big this cat really is uh, to really help determine, you know, uh, is this uh, a slightly doctored photo? Was it distortion because of the camera lens, anything like that, that made this cat look bigger than it was? And in fact, that was a very large shag bark hickory. Uh, and so using the size of the shag bark hickory and features on this animal, including the black backs to the ears, the very long, thick, ropey tail, uh, you could identify this as a mountain lion. It also has a very large, blocky face. And then just six months later, in Greene County, which was very close to this Clay County observation, uh, a hunter found uh, this, this pile of leaves, and he thought it was a little bit odd while he was out on the property. So he investigated and saw that this was actually a scrape, which large cats are known to do, bobcats and mountain lions, uh, to cache their extra food so they can come back and feed at a later time. And so what I've highlighted here on the photo are the two sets of hooves that you can see poking out from under those leaves. So we were actually able to go out to this site, confirm that yes, there was a deer hidden underneath here, and the uh, feeding pattern on the deer was consistent with that of a mountain lion. Uh, because of this, we were you know, very interested in setting up trail cameras to get uh, the first photos of a mountain lion for the first time in Indiana in well over 100 years. Uh, so we set up trail cameras, and sure enough, the mountain lion returned, and we were actually able to get some really good photos of this animal. 
Uh, granted, this happened in 2010 when the evolution of trail cameras was still uh, improving, so we didn't get the best shots. But again, you can see that really large blocky face. You can see black backs to the ears, rounded ears too, which is an important identifier when you're comparing it to other cat species. Uh, it's a very robust animal. You can see that long, thick, ropey tail that starts to end in black fur on the very tip of it. Uh, so because of that these, these two sightings were uh, very close together distance-wise and in time, only six months apart, we believe that this was uh, the same animal. Since then, we didn't have any sightings of this animal, uh, so it is believed that it continued to move on through Indiana, whichever way it was going. Uh, but we haven't had any confirmed sightings of a mountain lion since this time. Now, when you have large animals and human populations, you're going to run into human-wildlife interactions, whether it's uh, animals moving through large cities uh, like Chicago or Indianapolis or Bloomington or wherever you live, even a small town. Uh, there's going to be interactions. Uh, I'm sure some of you may have had experiences with woodpeckers packing on your house or uh, raccoons going through your trash can. Now magnify that to a large animal. If you have unsecured trash cans, you definitely don't want a bear rummaging through your trash and learning that it can hang out near your house to get free food, as that could put you in harm's way. So one thing I'd like to point out is that human-wildlife interactions can be positive if we take precautions. So with that bear example I just gave, if you were to secure your trash cans and you knew there were bears in the area, if you secured your trash cans so that a bear couldn't open them or tip them over, if you uh, took down bird feeders so there wasn't that extra source of food for bears to get into, bears would be less likely to think that or to learn that there's food associated with these human buildings. So bears would probably just pass through your backyards foraging for things that bears would eat instead of going straight to your trash cans or trying to break into a, a window or a door to get to a refrigerator because it's uh, tasted, you know, sugary and, and very carbohydrate rich foods that we have. But human wildlife interactions can also be negative if these precautions aren't taken. So that can be a negative social interaction. Uh, it can be negative economically, as you can see on this photo here of a, a corn crop that a black bear uh, caused significant damage to. Uh, black bears are known to hibernate in corn crops in areas where it doesn't get very, very cold. So down in Kentucky, they can do this. Um, but they also roam through the fields, uh, kind of just rolling through the corn, breaking stalks and eating all the husks that they can, uh, which definitely isn't good for the bear because corn isn't the best food for them, especially at the time of the year when corn is ripe. Uh, but I, I digress. Uh, you can also have livestock depredation or pet mortalities as a negative interaction by having large animals around, but not taking precautions to deter them uh, from around your human uh, houses. So there's a need to monitor these large mammals uh, once they're on the environment. And so to, to get this started, we developed the Large Mammal Report in 2015 after we had uh, that one transient wolf and then those confirmed mountain lion reports. Uh, so we, we realized that we needed a better way to get the public to send us their observations because you guys are our eyes and ears on the environment. There's only uh, one of me and then another biologist in my program. So our uh, ability to see everything at all times is, is limited. Uh, but having you guys help us out by sending observations of things you see in your backyard or uh, tracks that you find on hikes, things like that, it can really go a long ways towards helping us with these large mammal reports and finding large mammals uh, so that we can track them and monitor their behaviors. And this is the, the, the shortened website we have for the Large Mammal Report. It's on.in.gov forward slash large mammal. And so this uh, Large Mammal Report has been going for about 10, uh, sorry, five years now. And the animal species that we have reportable on here include black bear, mountain lion, gray wolf, and bobcat. And we included bobcat even though uh, I'm not defining it as a large mammal for the purpose of this presentation. We have bobcat on there because at the time of 2015, we were concerned about their uh, populations. We wanted to know how often people were really seeing them uh, other than the roadkill reports we typically get. So we included them on there just to see you know, just how often these animals are being seen by people. And so through the large mammal report alone, I've received over 1,200 submissions from about 2015 to early this year. 
And if you were to include all the other submissions that I've received between Facebook or uh, DFW's email address, uh, including the large mail reports, calls and emails that I get or other biologists get, uh, I'm looking at something closer to uh, three to 400 reports annually. So with the large mail report here, it's about 200 reports annually. And with everything else, it increases by a lot. So having one uh, system where people can submit reports really makes it a lot more simple. And I'm getting uh, consistent information between people in terms of what they see, what the animal's doing, and what they were doing when they saw the animal. So when you're submitting a large mammal report, it's going to ask you a few questions. And one of them is the observation type. Uh, did you see a live animal? Did you see a dead animal? Did you see tracks or scat of a large mammal? And so the photo I have here is an observation of a live animal. Uh, you, it's best to include evidence if you have it, but don't go out of your way uh, to you know, stand in front of a bear to get a cell phone picture of it. You know, Keep yourself safe. If you can't get a photo, if you can't get a video, it's okay. Animals leave tracks where they walk, so wait for the animal to leave and you can get a photo of the track later. So uh, a gentleman in 2018 was actually able to send us a photo of this bear uh, that had been hit on the highway down by New, uh, New Albany. So this is considered an observation of a live animal with evidence, which is the type of observation I'm going for. You can also submit encounters. Now this is a cell phone photo taken from a deer hunter near Big Oaks National Wildlife Preserve uh, back in 2016 when we had another bear come up from Kentucky. Uh, it roamed across about seven to nine counties in southern Indiana before it found a spot to overwinter near Big Oaks. Uh, and this guy had a very safe encounter with the bear. Uh, the bear smelled the man, was able to snuffle around the tree. He attempted to climb it a little bit uh, a little higher to get a view of this guy. Uh, and after he got a smell and a little bit of a view of this uh, human, he was able to just satisfy his curiosity and go off on his way. He had no interest in dealing with people which is the encounter that most people will have with untrained large mammals. Uh, and when I say untrained, I mean bears are very smart. And if you don't uh, secure trash cans, take down bird feeders, things like that, they learn very quickly that humans mean food. And so if that had been a, a bear that had been taught bad things by humans, uh, that encounter could have gone much different. Unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, and then also, if you have livestock or a pet attacked by a large animal, uh, we'd like to get those reported as well. I've included a news article right there at the bottom, just the headline, uh, of a recent encounter we had in Brown County, where someone's house cat was actually attacked, uh, and they reported it as a mountain lion. Uh, they, they, two eyewitnesses said they saw a mountain lion, so uh, we were actually able to get conservation officers out there. They uh, were able to walk through the woods in the direction the animal had went, they actually caught up to the animal. Uh, it got spooked and ran off, but it dropped the house cat that it had killed. And so I was able to obtain that carcass and take swabs of the bite marks from it to get confirmation from saliva left on the bite marks on the neck and the head that it was actually a bobcat that had attacked and killed that uh, house cat and not a mountain lion. But then when you're submitting a large mammal report, it also asks you a few other questions. So the species observed, the date, the time, location, and if you can be as specific as possible on that, that'd be fantastic. Uh, this large mammal report doesn't have a map feature where you can drop a pin, but you can uh, give me a address. Uh, so whatever the nearest address is or the nearest crossroads of intersections, that would be perfect. That at least gives me something closer to look for. Uh, and then the behavior of the animal. So was it walking, was it running, et cetera? And if it's at all possible, like I said, gather evidence or try to protect that evidence. So you can take pictures of tracks and scat. Uh, you can take videos of it. Uh, but try to get something in the photo that I can use for scale. So if you don't have a ruler handy, put something in the frame that maybe I have, like a pen or a dollar bill or a coin even. Any of those things are perfect. Uh, something that I can pull out and measure and then compare that size to your photos or video. And so of the reports I've received so far, those 1,200 plus reports, about half of them have been bobcats, which is really good. That means there's lots of bobcats on the environment. But we're here to talk about large mammals. Uh, so a full third of them have been cougars or mountain lions, uh, which is very impressive that there's uh, a lot of reports coming in. A lot of people are submitting these, although not a lot of these have evidence. Most of them were 
people making reports of animals they saw as they uh, were driving on a highway, something like that. And they just wanted to get the report out there so that we were aware. Uh, there's 6% of wolf reports. Um, these others and choose one uh, were uh, reports that people didn't know what species it was, so they just left it blank. Uh, and we had to go through later and fill it out. Most of them were for cougar or mountain lion reports. And then it's interesting that uh, bears make up 4% of the reports that we received of large mammals, uh, given that we've had at least three bears come through the state in the past five years, and a lot of people saw them in northern and southern Indiana, uh, but only a small percentage of those people actually made a report through the large mammal report. So we need to increase people's awareness of the large mammal report system and how to use it so that this can be an effective management tool for us so we can track these animals see what their behaviors like as they move across indiana or when they decide to stay here we can track them through time and see okay are they learning some of these negative traits that we don't want them to have do we need to uh, haze them whenever they get close to cities so they're not getting into dumpsters things like that so examples are always fun to go through uh, and, and some of the examples uh, I'd like to go through include the black bears. So in 2015, a bear came down from Michigan in northern Indiana, and it quickly learned some very bad traits. Uh, it, it got into trash cans, it got into bird feeders, and we actually got really good evidence of the bear doing this. Uh, in 2017, there were lots of reports, both confirmed and unconfirmed, of a black bear moving across southern Indiana. This is the one that went to Big Oaks National Wildlife Preserve. Uh, people were actually able to take photos of the tracks the bear left, photos of the bear moving across their backyards or across roads. We had a lot of really good evidence coming in of this bear, and we were able to use it to monitor where this bear was going, which was very, very useful. And you can see, uh, mapping out some of these reports, you can monitor not only the movements, but the behavior of this animal. So is it is it trying to stay away from humans? Is it uh, going more towards cropland? Is it going towards protected forests? Uh, where is it going and, and what is it doing on some of these observations? And you can see on this map, the yellow are unconfirmed reports, meaning that there was no evidence or the evidence wasn't of high enough quality to actually confirm that was a bear or it was too degraded, a track that had eroded after a hard rain, something like that. And then the confirmed reports are in red. So there aren't too many confirmed reports, but using those unconfirmed reports, you can actually uh, sort of predict where the bear is going to go and, and maybe use that to help uh, inform communities, hey, like get your trash cans in or take your bird feeders down, things like that. And so using these observations, we were actually able to create a habitat suitability model. And we did this by combining information of black bear habitats and the habitats they live in east of the Mississippi. And we tailored that towards Indiana's habitats. And you can tell that the areas in red are high quality habitat for black bears, at least potentially high quality. It's up to the black bear to determine that in the end. Uh, but when black bears do start coming into the state, we expect them to come into the state and stay in southern Indiana, where there's a lot of really good forested habitat, forested and hilly habitat. That's what they're looking for. And this is uh, an example of evidence that has something for scale in there. This is the 2018 black bear that got hit down by New Albany. Uh, a CO was called to the scene um, within an hour of the uh, person hitting that black bear. Uh, they went through the woods where the citizens saw the animal go to. They were actually able to find this track. They placed a dollar bill next to it. And with that, I was actually able to measure it out and say, yes, that is uh, a black bear track. Uh, and then you can see that there are five toes there with one really large pad. Uh, the track is wider than it is long. Uh, so we were able to confirm very quickly that there was a black bear down there. And that happened down by New Albany, as I mentioned, kind of in that red zone that's high quality habitat uh, for black bears, as we predicted the year before, or at least earlier that year. So then this is where the large mammal report really shines. Uh, we wanted to know where this bear was going. And we were able to actually get a trail cam photo of this bear about 10 miles to the north. Uh, this was about 15 days later, but the trail camera photo is dated only a couple days after this, uh, the first report was made. So we sent a biologist out to the scene and they confirmed that the soybean field was in fact uh, still present in this area. So no one had tried to doctor this photo or take a photo from the internet and send it in. But then we were actually able to uh, investigate a little bit more, walk down that trail where the bear was, and you could see that there was black bear scat down there. 
And this uh, definitely sealed that, yes, this black bear was in this location at this time. Uh, and then we could we could use that to figure out where that bear was moving to. Now, moving on to another hot topic we have here in Indiana with large mammals, and I see that I'm running out of time. So I'll, I'll go as quick as I can without going too fast. Uh, within the past five years, we've had over 400 reports of mountain lions. Uh, and, and what I want to point out here is the difference in size between mountain lions, bobcats, and house cats. And, and I've been talking about scale when looking at some of this evidence. And if you don't have something for scale uh, or you don't provide that scale in the evidence, it makes it harder to get a confirmed uh, report for a bobcat, a mountain lion, a black bear. So having something to scale on these photos and videos is excellent. But identifying a mountain lion, I pointed out that really thick ropey tail. It hangs down well below that hind leg and well past the animal too. It's almost the size of their body. So their body is about three to four feet long and that tail is going to be two to four feet long as well, depending on the animal and its body condition. And unlike bobcats and house cats, mountain lions have rounded tips to their ears. Uh, bobcats kind of have rounded tips, but they also have uh, little uh, fur tufts there that make them look a little bit more pointed. And I had pointed out that mountain lions also have that blocky face compared to a very small pointed face of a house cat. And so using those photos that we uh, collected of, a, of the mountain lion in 2010, you can see some of these features, the very thick, long, ropey tail, rounded ears, blocky face. Now compared to this photo uh, that was misidentified as a mountain lion and sent to us, uh, you can see that there's a black tip on that tail, but the tail doesn't extend much beyond the rump of this animal. You can almost think that uh, there's a very dark black dot. Maybe if you can see my cursor, there's that dark black dot. Uh, and then further down, there's a longer uh, kind of oval shaped dark splotch. And that is actually the back of the animal's hind foot right there. Uh, but in addition to that animal having a short tail, uh, we were actually able to get the size of that tree in the background, which helped us confirm that yes, this was a bobcat. We also get photos uh, uh, such as this, where you can see that this animal has a long tail, it at least goes down to its hind feet, but it doesn't go well past the animal like you'd expect a mountain lion's tail to go. This animal has pointed ears, and it also has a very short, uh, not blocky and pointed face. And so that's one really good clue that that is a house cat and not a mountain lion. Uh, similar with this photo, that tail looks like it's thick, but it's definitely not as thick and ropey as a mountain lion's, and it doesn't extend that far past the animal. A mountain lion's tail is going to swoop down and nearly touch the ground and then extend past the animal. And this one, uh, if you were to straighten that out towards its leg, it maybe reaches its hind foot. So we're uh, using, using keys like this, even if you don't have scale in the photo, we can use multiple traits of uh, mountain lions and bobcats to identify the evidence that you send in and to help educate you uh, to tell you how to identify these. Uh, we also get some hoaxes, uh, and, and they're kind of fun to tease apart. So we received this photo, and you can tell from the background that the sun is out, it's a shiny bright day, but this mountain lion appears to be shaded, and the shade isn't the same as what's on the foreground. So we did a quick Google search of you know mountain lions, and we came up with this photo, and it's it's an exact match. You can even see where they photoshopped out part of its front uh, left leg there when they when they cut it and put it into this trail camera photo. So sometimes we do get hoaxes of of mountain lions, uh, and it it takes time out of our day to to tease them apart to see if it's actually uh, something that we need to investigate, and we need to get someone out there to tell the community, hey, there's a, a mountain lion out there. This is what you should do. Uh, and, and yeah, it, it takes a while to untease these things. Uh, we also get a lot of reports about urban legends. And some of these urban legends include uh, black mountain lions. And one thing I can say is that in the scientific literature, there are black uh, jaguars, leopards, and those occur around the tropics near the equator. And mountain lions, as you saw in their geographic range, they occur across North America, South America, and Central America. So you'd think there would be black mountain lions in Central America where there are black jaguars as well. Uh, however, in the history of museum records, there hasn't been a black mountain lion pelt to show up. So this is most likely an urban legend, unless it is so extremely rare that it just hasn't showed up yet. 
but in North America's history of scientists exploring it and capturing animals, and even in the history of the 1800s, when uh, settlers and colonists were moving westward, they never shot a black mountain lion. So it's likely an urban legend, uh, as, as amazing as it would be to see a, a black-coated mountain lion. I, I just don't believe that they are out there at this time, or at least they haven't been documented by science. So the large mammals of Indiana, I just want to go over this one more time, are the black bears. Uh, we've had three of them, can, three black bears confirmed in Indiana since 2015. And that's just uh, what we have now. We have expanding populations in Kentucky and Michigan, which are eventually going to make it to Indiana. And it's likely going to be young males that are dispersing, trying to find their own range, their own habitat to claim as their own. Uh, but that need to mate is going to pull them back towards the population where females are. And so for the next few years, we might not see any uh, uh, reproduction in black bears here in Indiana unless we have a female move here with cubs. And black bear cubs can follow the mother for up to two years. So there is a potential for seeing these around. But I don't anticipate that being for the next few years at least, uh, maybe not even in the next 25 years. But it is an eventuality for Indiana. And once that happens, once we get reproductive black bears here, then we'll have a breeding population. Uh, so until then, we won't have a breeding population and our management's going to be very hands off. We're going to want to learn what these males are doing in Indiana, but uh, we kind of just want to monitor them uh, where they're using habitat, what their behavior is, uh, and just try to stay out of their way and let a bear be a bear. And then as far as mountain lions and wolves go, it's going to be very rare. Uh, we're just going to have those rare transient animals moving across large areas. They're likely going to keep moving through Indiana to get to wherever that destination is. Uh, there was a record of a mountain lion moving from the North Dakotas all the way across to Connecticut before it was finally hit by a car. So whatever biological uh, urge is driving these animals on these long transient journeys, uh, it's driving them long distances and very few of them are doing this. And in terms of the other large mammals that Indiana historically had, such as elk and bison, there are no plans to reintroduce these animals at this time. Uh, as far as elk go, uh, they are a CWD or chronic wasting disease susceptible species. Uh, so if we were to move elk here, it would be a very large undertaking in terms of personnel, time, and resources that we could be spending to protect other imperiled species that Indiana has. And if we got them here, it's only an eventuality that CWD will come to Indiana. Uh, we will slow it down as best we can, but in time, it may get here. And if we go through the effort of reintroducing elk and then CWD hits them, it would devastate the herd. And that is something that... Uh, would be unfair to an elk population to bring in just to have that happen within a matter of uh, you know unknown time. So with that, I want to thank you for your observations. I know I went over time, but I will gladly answer as many questions as I can if Morgan can help me. Yep, I've got you, Brad. All right, guys, so I know we're a little bit over on time here, and if you need to jump off, this webinar is going to be recorded. Feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat box, and we're going to go ahead and start going through them here. Um, any questions that we don't get to in the next few minutes, we will compile and send out via email to all of you, so you guys will get answers to this. All right, so the first question is from Heather. Is there a map available of all the sightings of large mammals in Indiana? Just curious what was spotted, where and when? Gosh, I know that's a really good question. There is not a map available of that yet, but that is something that I am working towards to get a, a front facing map of the large mammal reports. Um, Wisconsin has a really good example of this where they have not only a map of that, but they have some of the reports filed uh, so that you can educate yourself in terms of what other people are submitting. You can see the evidence that they've submitted and then whether it was confirmed, uh, what was needed to confirm it, uh, if it was misidentified, things like that. So that's the direction I'd like to take uh, our website tools, but it's not up there yet. Perfect. All right. Uh, next question is from Jill. I assume you're not discussing boars because we aren't within their historic range. Yeah, yeah. So uh, wild hogs or boars uh, were introduced by Europeans and, and just based on how I was defining large mammals, 
that's a, an introduced species uh, that I was only looking at uh, native animals here in Indiana. Sorry, I should have clarified that. Good question. Any other questions you guys have? Feel free to drop them in the chat box. If you're viewing on mobile, it's up in the upper right hand corner of the screen. And if you tap your screen, you can access that. Jill asked, what percentage of cougar sightings actually pan out? Since we've uh, started the large mammal report, we've had 0% of them actually pan out. And, and that's not to say that uh, the sightings that have been submitted have, have all just been, you know, flops. A lot of them have come in without evidence. Uh, I, was, I was running some numbers earlier, and well over 90% of them that come in come in without evidence. A fleeting thing that people see. And, and that's how it is with most mammals whenever you see them, especially when you're driving. I mean, a, a loud car with headlights is going to spook most mammals away. So a lot of people submit these reports saying that they were, you know, driving down uh, I-70, something like that. And, and they caught this glimpse of something that was brown. It looked like it had this. They couldn't give me an exact location to go find tracks. Uh, but I have those reports. And the idea is with lots of people submitting these reports, should an animal turn up, I'd be able to use those unconfirmed reports like I did with the black bear in 2016 to help narrow down where that animal is with a confirmed report eventually. And, and those just haven't panned out at this time. Okay, next question is from Heather. I believe you had 1,200 reports submitted between 2015 and 2020. Are most of them false or what percentage is actual or confirmed sightings? Gotcha. Uh, I didn't run those numbers to figure that out because uh, as you saw, bobcats accounted for almost 50% of them. And bobcats are, are a species that is no longer in my purview. Uh, so I, I, I looked at the numbers, but I realized that it included a lot of bobcat sightings. Uh, and most of those ones were accurate. When it came to the actual large mammals, uh, so the mountain lion reports in particular, uh, most of those were bobcats or house cats uh, that had evidence with them. And then the wolf reports that I had, most of them were coyotes or dogs, uh, but again, a lot of them didn't have evidence, so it's hard to say how many of them were just like outright false and how many of them were confirmable or accurate. Good question. Next question is from Kevin. Has Indiana considered stalking black bears to southern Indiana? Uh, so at this time, we haven't uh, seriously considered that. Uh, I, I don't think that is something we will do just because there are naturally expanding populations coming in, especially from Kentucky. Uh, so we're going to get them. I think if we were to uh, speed that up by moving a black bear here, we'd probably move a black bear out of a known habitat into uh, an unknown, and it might get into trouble if we did that, mostly because uh, Hoosiers and the Indiana DNR, we all need to get our, our living with bears uh, education down before we actually get, uh, before we try to reintroduce anything like black bears or before black bears really get here in large numbers so that we're not training black bears to you know, tear through dumpsters or uh, become urban bears that are, you know, going through alleys to find treats or breaking into cars in state parks, things like that. So at this time, no, there's no plans to do that. Uh, but um, we're hoping that they will naturally expand here and we'll get a slow introduction to them so that Hoosiers can get used to uh, living with bears and following those guidelines of how to live with bears peacefully. All right, any other questions before we wrap this up here? Oh, all right, we got one from Finn. Does this mean reports without evidence where people are unsure or that turn out to be some other species are also valuable to your data? Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, so uh, it, it helps us understand not only what is a hot topic on people's minds. So if I'm getting lots of mountain lion, mountain lion reports at a certain time of year, 
I know that maybe in this certain region of the state at that time of year, people are thinking about bears and mountain lions. A lot of times it coincides with uh, events in the news. So recently we had that uh, that video of a hiker in Utah who was being followed by a mountain lion in a very aggressive way. She was trying to chase him off. Uh, and, and we had our mountain lion reports peak right after that too. So a lot of times it, it follows things like that. But uh, with bobcats being on the large mammal report, it's very helpful getting those reports, even if they're filed as mountain lions. It's easy enough for me to click a button and change it from mountain lion report to a bobcat uh, so that we have that data. And, you know, sometimes people are going to see something cool. Maybe a, a bear report is going to come in as a boar, and that's going to be something we want to know. Or maybe a uh, uh, an other report is actually going to be, turn out to be uh, some escaped exotic animal that uh, someone hadn't actually reported to us yet, which is something that happened a few years back with a serval escaping someone's uh, domestic enclosure they had for it. And I couldn't believe my eyes that I saw a serval on on those photos, but it sure enough was. And so we had to call the right people to get that animal uh, captured again. Perfect. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here, folks. Um, we'll be posting this recorded webinar at that link that I posted earlier, and I'll post it here again. Um, you can access that at the Large Mammal Report site. Thank you guys so much for joining us, and we hope you have a great evening.